My name is Jessica Todd. I'm one of the ESL instructors for Intermediate Reading and Writing. And today your instructors and I are so excited to have the author of our novel this semester, um, N.H. Senze, here with us. Um, so let's welcome her with a big round of applause. One quick thing too, um, Ms. Enze said that if you have any questions during her talk or you don't understand something, please feel free to raise your hand. And we'll also have 15 or 20 minutes at the end of the talk where you can ask your questions that you've prepared or any that you think of while she's talking. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you for having me come visit you. And hello, um, you can call me Nahid, actually. My first name is Nahid. And I'm really excited because usually um, my books are read uh, by children, but also it's been read by adults. And this is the first time I've had an opportunity to come talk to some, su such a great group of people who can kind of uh, read the story um, and also, uh, you know, uh, go on the journey that Fadi had. So I'm, you know, thrilled to be here. And I find myself to be very boring. So in the middle, I'm going to ask you guys some questions. And if there's anything that you want me to slow down or ask a question about, feel free. Just raise your hands, and we can talk more. So as I was introduced, my name is Nahid Hasnat Senzai. And actually, Nahid Hasnat is my name, and the Senzai is my husband's name. So I took his last name because he's from Afghanistan, and actually, I'm not. I'm from India and Pakistan. So when I decided to write this book, I decided to take his name um, so that peop you know, people would know that it comes from you know, an Afghan background. So Shooting Kabul was my first book. It w came out six years ago in 2010. And after that, I wrote a book called Saving Kabul Corner. And it's about Mariam's best friend. And it also takes place in Fremont, California. So you guys have heard of Fremont, right? Yes. Fremont. So that book, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a mystery. It's about two grocery stores that are fighting with each other. And so it, a lot of the characters like Fadi and Mariam showed up in this book. So my third book is called Ticket to India. And so my first two books were about Afghanistan. And this one is about India and Pakistan and about partition. So did you know that India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh used to be one country? Yes. And when partition happened back in 1947, uh, a lot of families were torn apart. So this story is kind of about a story about a grandmother and her granddaughters. And the book that I'm writing right now is called Escape from Aleppo. It's about Syria. It's about a girl in Syria who is escaping the city of Aleppo because um, as you know, the war in Syria has been going on now for a very long time. So I wanted to write about you know, the experiences of, of a Syrian family. So I always ask this of my uh, audience. Are there any writers out there? Any of you want to write a book in your, you know, perfect. I, you know, I always say this, especially you know, you know, with your background, as you know, many of you are talking uh, to Jessica, uh, you know, there are many refugees in this group, many new immigrants. Um, as you learn English, you have amazing stories, amazing stories from your homeland, from your families. And I always say this, that, you know, you have such a unique, you know, background and family stories that I, I encourage you to write your own story. It doesn't have to be a novel, but you start with small stories and share them with your family. Um, because, you know, the, pers the, the perspectives you come from uh, to this country, to the United States, are so special and unique. So that, you know, I always uh, encourage, you know, people to write their stories. So a little bit about how I became a writer. So I was born in Chicago, and my father came from India in, in the 1960s. And he came to a state called Minnesota. Do you guys know where Minnesota is? Do you know how much snow there is in Minnesota? Yes. So my dad was very cold, and he kept moving west. So he moved to Chicago, and then when I was two months old, he moved to San Francisco. And so he was an engineer, and then he got a job far, far away. 
he got a job in Saudi Arabia. He's a civil engineer. So back in the 70s, what were they doing in Saudi Arabia? What did they find? Black gold. What did they find? Oil, right? They had a lot of money, so they were building and building in Saudi Arabia. But in Saudi Arabia, it's very hot. So hot, you can take an egg, crack it on the road, and it will cook. So who comes from a really hot country? Yes? So what do you do? When it's so hot, you, what do you do to keep cool? Yes, do you drink water? Yes? You go swimming? Yes? I know there's an Israeli in here too, so I know it's hot. <laughs> yes? <laughs> so one of the things we did, we were very lucky, is we had a great library and air conditioning. So my two librarians, who I still keep in touch with today, they're, they're Mrs. Hackworth and Mrs. Murray, and they're in their 80s. So if you look at shooting Kabul in there, I say thank you to Mrs. Hackworth and Mrs. Murray. And they introduced me to great books. And I read a lot. I read novels, and I also wrote a lot of nonfiction. I was interested in science and the ocean, and all of these things, you know, kind of helped me become a future writer. And I had very supportive teachers as well who you know, encouraged me to write. And I know you guys have some great you know, uh, teachers as well. So as you learn you know, English and you learn you know, the magic of words, I encourage you, you know, as I said, to write your stories down. So these are some of my favorite books when I was a kid. Um, Sport, The Witches. Who's heard of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? You should definitely read that. Very good. You, know, you always want to read something that has Chocolate Factory in the title. It's about chocolate. It's very good. Once I graduated, um, you know, school finished for me in Saudi Arabia at eighth grade. I went to boarding school. I went to boarding school in England for three years, and I graduated high school. And I went to college. I came back right next door. I went to school in Berkeley. And then I decided, you know, I've always wanted to be a writer. And who knows, you know, who, who has Nike shoes? Nike shoes, tennis shoes, yeah. They have a slogan, it's called, just do it, right? And I said, if I'm going to write a book, I need to just do it. And um, who knows who this guy is? Any ideas? He looks like a philosopher, doesn't he? Aristotle, I get Aristotle. He was a famous philosopher. He's not Aristotle. His, I can never pronounce his name either. It's called, his name is Epictetus. And what he said, if you wish to be a writer, you must write. And writing is a very personal thing. Your mom doesn't come to you and say, honey, did you finish chapter one? You know, you don't have a boss. You have to do it. It's a very personal, private thing that you do. You know, I love to write in cafes. You go, you take your laptop, and you go write. And I thought, you know, I don't want to turn 80 years old one day and say, you know, I should have written a book. You don't want to do that in anything. If there's something you're passionate about, do it tomorrow. Because you don't want to wake up when you're 70, 80, and say, I should have you know, tried to be a fashion designer or write a book. Um, or you know, maybe becoming a basketball star is a bit late for us now. But you know, something that you can do, you should, become, you, should, you should do it today. You should do it tomorrow. So I had the idea. So I'll also say this too. Life is full of failure. My first book is not shooting Kabul. I wrote a book about a boy who goes on a journey through Italy and Turkey and Spain. And that book never sold. That means it was never taken by a publisher to become a book. So when that didn't work, I said, should I give up? No. Right? And so I had the idea to write shooting Kabul. And who inspired me to write this book is this guy. Anybody know who he is? You shouldn't. He's my husband. But, you know, his, his name is Farid Senzai. And, you know, who's married? Who's married? Who's married? Raise hands. Who's married? Right? 
your husband and your wife will always, you know, occasionally say really dumb things, and you laugh at them. And this is what he said to me. I'm the most interesting person you know. You should write about me. <laughs> so I laughed, and then I thought about it, because Fareed's family comes from Kabul and Afghanistan. And like Fadi's dad, his father got his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in agriculture, and he went back to Afghanistan in the 1970s to teach. And then the Soviets invaded. Do you guys know a little bit of history about, you know, this USA, USSR, you know, communism, freedom, you know. So the USSR, which is uh, Russia now, had invaded Afghanistan in the 70s. So his dad had to make a really important decision. Where's Jessica? Keep me honest um, on time. Tell me, you know, yeah. yeah? So as we're getting closer. So he, he said, you know, he said, like Fadi's dad, you know, his dad was given an option, become a communist or pick up a gun and go into the hills and fight the, fight the Soviets, the Russians. And he decided he didn't want to do either of those things. So since he had studied in America, they became refugees and they came to the US at the, you know, in the late 70s. So I thought about it. So you know, this is, you know, as I was saying, his dad was a professor and they really thought about it of what to do. And they came and finally they emigrated and came to um, first Ohio, then Sacramento. And so did you know that Fremont, where this, the book takes place, now here's a question, am I going okay? The speed is okay, am I? Okay, always, let me know, because you know, I'm here to have a discussion with you and I don't want to lose you. So did you know that Fremont has the largest numbers of Afghans outside of Afghanistan? Yes, knowledgeable people in this group. And if you want really good Afghan food, you need to come, come down to Fremont. So who has seen this picture? Yeah? This is actually one of the most famous pictures in the world. So we're talking about what inspired me to write the book. So you know shooting Kabul? Who thought shooting meant a gun? Right? And you know it's actually shooting a picture. And when I was a kid, I loved photography, and I um, was inspired by this picture. And the, um, this gentleman who took this picture is Steve McCurry. He's, he's a famous, famous photojournalist. And he and I are friends. And who is, have you guys finished reading Shooting Cobble yet? No, okay, then I'm not gonna give anything away. But <laughs> he makes an appearance in the book, so keep an eye on him. And so he took this picture of this girl, and this girl, remember I was talking about when Afghanistan was invaded by USSR? So this girl was from that time. Her village was bombed. Everyone was killed except for her and her grandmother and some of her family. So they became refugees, crossed the mountains, and came to Pakistan. So Steve was there taking pictures, and he took a picture of her. And it got sent to National Geographic. They put it on the cover, and people fell in love with this girl. They wanted to adopt her, to marry her. She was only 12, you know. <laughs> um, send her money. And what happened was, Steve didn't know who she was. He went back 10 times to look for her. He couldn't find her. So do you know if she was ever found? Yes, she was found. And do you know how he proved it was her? Because how do we have proof that, you know, the gentleman in the, in the blue sweatshirt, let's say I take a picture of you. 10 years later, you say, that I, uh, that, what's your name? Luis. Chris? Luis. 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 And you're like, and, and the picture becomes very famous, and you come to me and say, that's me. Where's my money? <laughs> How do we prove that Luis is the man in the picture? Do you know? Do we have his, did he, do we, his fingerprints? But no, we, he never took her fingerprints. You're very close. What is your name? Lorena. Lorena. Very close. So this is a clue. She had beautiful green eyes. So who's seen movies, you know, uh, with spies? They have, you know, you, they, they, they use their eye to do, you know, uh, to recognize who it is. So everyone in this room, their eyes, 
the way their blood vessels grow is very unique. It's like a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. So Steve had her original picture, and he took, had taken her picture, and he was able, the FBI matched it. So her name is Sharbat Gula, and so Steve and his sister Bonnie have, had, have a foundation for her, but she was recently in the news as well because Pakistan kicked her out. Because, you know, there's a lot of tension right now in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So she was arrested, she was in jail, but Sharbat is now in Afghanistan. So these are the things that excited me to write this book. My husband's story, love of photography. But, you know, I really hesitated when I decided to write this book because, you know, it's a very personal story. So I'm not from Afghanistan, my husband is. And everybody knows, especially the married people, you don't want to upset your mother-in-law, <laughs> right? So I was like, I'm going to write about my husband's family. I have to make sure it's very accurate and very correct because you don't want an unhappy mother-in-law. And of course, you know, the, the culture and the politics of Afghanistan is very complicated. So you want to make sure you do it correctly. And also, you know, there's bullies in the book. You've, you know, you've read about Felix and Ike, but also, you know, 9-11 is in the book. And people said, are you crazy? Why are you going to write about 9-11? Because I felt, this is my philosophy, that as a writer, kids are very smart. In a way, they're smarter than we are. And they understand more. And if you give them big ideas, they absorb them and Hopefully, in the future, as they grow up, they can think back to the things they've learned and apply them to real life. So I thought, you know, if I don't write this book, didn't I tell you in the beginning? All of you have a personal story. I can't write Louise's book, you know? I'm sure he has a fascinating story about his background. So I realized if I don't write this book, nobody else was going to write this book. And so there are themes in the book. Themes means ideas. There are certain ideas in the book. And part of it is that the Taliban, when they came into Afghanistan, were not bad. Right now, they're bad, right? In the news and everything, you hear these Taliban, they're so bad. You know, they shut down schools, and they beat people, and have wars. Even Osama bin Laden, I don't know if you know, when he was in Afghanistan, he was in Afghanistan when the Soviets invaded, and the American government gave him money to fight the Russians, because at that time, America and the Soviet Union were fighting each other. So he was a good guy then. And of course now, you know, we've known what he's done. And also Ike and Felix, the bullies in the book, they didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna be a bully. They had issues in their own life, and they made poor decisions on how to act. So also Fadi, I don't know if you've noticed, He's a terrible loser. Everything, he's <laughs> failure, right? You know, I don't know where you're in the book, but every idea he has, pretty bad, yeah. right? Yeah. Getting into his dad's cab, not so good. So part of it is, like when I wrote my first book and it didn't sell, if you don't, if your plan A fails, have a plan B, have a plan C. Because we, all, we never in life get what we want. That's a sad fact, usually. So always have a plan for your next idea. And also, don't judge a book by its cover. Now, I'm hoping this audience is, it will figure this one out. So these two men, and I show this to kids whenever I do school visits, can you tell me if they're the same or different? They have a beard, they have a turban. Are they the same or different? Anyone? They're the same? They come from the same place? Raise your hand, yeah. They're the same, they're the same type of men. Okay, anybody? I know there's someone in here who knows the answer. Yeah, the teachers, yeah, anyone else? Okay, so the man on this one, on my right, he is a Taliban. He is a Muslim man. But Talib also means student, so it doesn't mean that you know, he's a fighter, but he comes from that community where the Talib came. He's an Afghan man. And the guy on the, uh, my left, he's a Sikh. He's a Sikh, he's from India, he's not Muslim. He follows the religion of Sikhism. They're two very different religions, two different places in the world, but we know 
that, you know, especially in the, you know, what happens um, in, in, in the political current, especially, you know, we're not going to talk about the election, but um, what happens is people assume that you look a certain way, you must be a certain thing. You, you stereotype people. So not, you know, so we unfortunately in our community have, you know, here even in San Francisco Bay Area, sick men have been beaten up because people say that they're Arab or Muslim or, you know, Taliban. And it's not just that, you know, Latinos, you're brown, you are this, this, this. You're Indian or Hindu and sick, this, this, and this. So we have to be very careful when we judge people. How are we doing on time? <gasps> Jessica? Oh, awesome, okay. So now I said, okay, I'm gonna write this book. I have my inspiration. I know I can't make my mother-in-law angry. I have to do really good research. Um, I decided kind of, the image that came into my mind was about a family escaping, right? A war, and about a, a brother losing his sister's hand. So that was the first you know, image that came into, into my mind. And that's kind of where the story began for me. And I'm gonna go over this quickly, but when you write, you guys decide, I'm, you know, I have homework for you. When you guys go home, one paragraph, write something about your family. And usually, we authors and writers, we follow the five W's. That's kind of the five W's. You need to know in your head before you start writing a book. And the first is who. So who is the who in shooting Kabul? Exactly. It's Fadi, it's his story. So I know who the who is. We need to know a what. What is your story about? So it's about a brother losing his sister, a Mariam. So when we say the word plot, what is the plot? What is the story about? This is the what. When, and this is very important too. Sometimes you write a story and you don't know when the beginning is, when the end is. It's always very helpful to have a timeline. So for me, the shooting couple, if you notice, starts in July, and you know it only goes over six months. The story ends in, in January. And where? Location, what we call setting in writing, is Kabul in California. And this is very important too. Why are you writing this story? So Lorena, Lorena, see? Yeah. yeah. So Lorena is writing about her grandmother who you know makes wonderful dishes. And we want to know why is she writing this. So maybe you know her grandmother has you know uh, you know a great mysterious recipe, and she has a restaurant. So we want to know the why of why you write your book as well. So I call this the ingredients. I like to eat, so a lot of my descriptions involve food. The ingredients of the story is we need a villain, and my uh, Barbie is my villain. Yeah, I was like, okay, you know what 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 is you know caused us to lose Mariam. And the problem is she's been lost and she needs to be found. And the solution is photography. And I'm not gonna give anything away, but you know, photography plays a very large role in the book. And I'll go over this quickly. I mean, you know, uh, I like to kind of give perspective on Afghanistan because the story is about Afghanistan. And you know, I think you'll look at this map and some of you come from these countries, right? And so I call, I joke with my husband, Farid, and I say, Afghanistan is the belly button of the world. You know where your belly button is, right? And I joke with him and I say it only collects lint. Because you know, you look in your belly button sometimes and there's weird things in there, right? It's, it's in the middle of the world. Why? Because the Silk Route, have you guys heard of the Silk Route? It was, it was the um, connection between China and Europe. And that's where ideas and goods used to be taken and sold all around the world. And Afghanistan was the center of that route. And you know, a lot of ideas came from China to Europe. So silk came from China, you know? And lapis lazuli. Anybody know what lapis lazuli is? I'm sure you've seen it, yeah? It's a beautiful blue stone. That came from Afghanistan. Spices and ivory came from India. And who knows who this is? Yeah, this is King Tutankhamun, uh, Tutankhamun, yes? You know his beard, the blue? 
lapis lazuli from Afghanistan. So think about it. That from Afghanistan ended up in, in, in Egypt. So, you know, there were smart people then doing trade all around the world. Also, ideas went from China, you know, and from India, and from Persia, and came from Europe, like religions, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, and knowledge, you know, literature, law, and also disease. Disease came. So this is our little friend who brought the plague. You know what the plague is? It's a very bad disease that people, thousands of people died, um, you know, especially in Europe um, that came from, from the rat. And also f my favorite subject, food. So this is a 4,000 year old bowl of noodles from China. They found this. 4,000 years old, can you imagine? So noodles traveled along the silk route. And in Afghanistan, they became Fadi's favorite dish, mandu, right? And so these noodles, in Nepal, they became the momo, you know, and you know, they became the bauzi, Turkey, Armenia, and they ended up in Europe as, you know, the tortellini. So even foods have, you know, gone, gone through this area. So who knows who this guy is? He's handsome, yes? Oops, sorry, I can't hear you, sorry. <laughs> Who said? Alexander the Great. Alexander came through Afghanistan with his armies. And who's this? Yes, smart group, you know, awesome group. So unfortunately, being the center of the world, there's a lot of wars. Alexander came through, Genghis Khan came through, the Mughals of India, Great Britain. So Afghanistan is proud to say they were never conquered by anyone. Even Britain, when they came, took over India, were never be, were able to conquer Afghanistan. So unfortunately, Afghanistan has had a lot of war. Um, they had a king in 1919, but what happened was the Soviet Union invaded 1979, and they had wars and wars and wars. And that's when the Taliban came in. And in the beginning, they were called the good guys because they came and they brought peace and stability to the country. But unfortunately, you know, they made some bad choices, right? Good guys becoming bad guys, bad guys coming, becoming good guys. And as I end shooting Kabul, you know, Karzai was, became the president. But unfortunately, Afghanistan, still is very, has a lot of conflict, even to today. And this is um, a picture of Kabul after the wars, where this poor little um, you know, girl is walking down the street of her neighborhood. And I unfortunately call Afghanistan sometimes a land of most. Because it has had so much war, it has a lot of poverty, lack of education. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the country itself, the buildings have been destroyed. And it's a very poor country um, where, you know, the average income is, is $426. And unfortunately, the, I always say this to my students, you're so lucky to live in a country where you have access to an education, um, where you, you know, and I say this to you, I, I wish you the best as you learn English and go on and, and, you know, achieve your dreams and your passions. But in Afghanistan, you know, it's a little less than half the boys can read or write and you know, one out of, two out of 10 girls. So it's, it's, it's a tough situation. So where do we have Jessica? Okay, of talking or the whole thing? Uh, I okay, great. So I'll talk a little bit about the writing process. I mentioned, you know, I wrote the first book and it didn't sell. And then I had the idea to write Shooting Kabul and I wrote it. But who can guess what my major was in college? I went to UC Berkeley down the road. Anybody know my major? What did I study in school? She's one of the first who's got her. Usually, usually I get English, literature, writing. No, I was an accounting major. Accounting. Yeah. So I say this to you. You know, you can be any major and still write a book. You just have to work hard at it, but you can do it. So what I did is when I woke up, remember Nike, just do it. And I said, I was 30. I said, I'm going to write a book 
or I don't want to wake up at 80 and say I should have written a book. So I joined, because you know, this is America. There is an association for everything. <laughs> if you like to knit, there's an association. If you like dogs, there's an association. If you like cooking, there's an association. So for us children's authors, there's something called the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And I joined, and they're wonderful people, because they're all other people who want to be writers. And through them, I learned, we call it the craft, the craft of writing, understanding plot, setting, character, and all of those things. And there's very one important write method in writing. It's called the BIC method. Anybody know what that means? BIC method, teachers? It's called butt in chair. <laughs> Remember, your mother's not telling you, honey, did you write your book? If your butt's not in a chair, you're not writing. And it has to do with discipline. You just have to be disciplined about it. Um, this is another thing, too. There are two kinds of writers. There are the people who are the plotters. Remember I said the word plot? They know the story before they start writing. And panster, I don't know if you've heard the American saying it's called fly by the seat of your pants. That means you just go for it. You don't think, you just do. So I'm a plotter. It's the accounting background. I'm very methodical. So you know, those are the two kinds of writers. So I actually um, am not a full-time writer. I still do accounting finance work. So for me, I you know, um, write in the evenings and on the weekends. And you know, it takes me, so since I'm a plotter, it takes me a few months to come up with my idea of my story and kind of lay it out. And then it takes me about nine months to write it. So my writing is usually about a year, but the whole process um, can, can, you know, takes from, from having written the book to, um, to actually getting it published can take two to three years. So, um, Unless you're more interested more about kind of the publishing industry, we can talk about that, or we can open it to q and I mean, we can, I direct you to that. Yeah, let's, let's do it. So. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, Please state your name and, and your question. Um, hello, my name is Helen. I am just a business class student. Uh, I really enjoy the unexpected uh, plots in your novels. Um, I hope if you can, would you like to? Um, yeah, would you like to write another? And now about the characters' lives in the U.S.? In the U.S.? Yes, because I like your book very much. I will prefer it to my children because my son is almost 11. Mm -hmm. I think she, he can read this book. Oh, very good. Thank you. Yes, no, uh, part of it was that, uh, you know, I was talking about everybody has a unique story, and if you don't write about it, no one will know. And America is, is a country of immigrants, you know, and now there are more and more writers who are writing, you know, stories about Vietnamese characters and, you know, Mexican characters and Loatian and from all around the world. And a lot of the books I love, too, are the ones where the character, you know, talks about their home country but also growing up here because everybody has their own unique, you know, experience. So. Uh, interestingly enough, um, so Shooting Cobble takes place in, in California and so does Saving Cobble Co um, Corner, the, uh, the book that comes after. Um, but my two most recent books, one takes place in India and the one I'm writing now takes place in Syria. So both are important because it's good for, you know, um, you know, other communities and cultures to know about each other. So, you know, it's, it's nice for, you know, uh, to, for kids to understand and grown-ups to understand about other people's cultures and their communities, to read books about characters from different places and around the world. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Um, one of my classmates I did this question, and I wanna I don't see him here, so I okay. was wondering. Okay. Um, he. he he knows that the name of Fadi means 
empty. And I am wondering what inspired you to, to uh, choose the name. Fabi? It's interesting. You talk to writers, and we have lists of names. We'll hear a name or see a name, because I have a list of names, too, of, of names that I like. Fadi is actually more of an Arab name than it is a traditional Afghan name. So for me, I just like the name. So there is no really, you know, and it's also, you know, also want to think it's a name that kids can pronounce or reading it too. You don't want to make it too complicated that it's, you know, as, as, as someone is reading the book, they, they, the, the name is familiar. So it's short, you know, it's easy. So that's why. So no, you know, major story behind Fadi's name, yeah. Well, Fadi is very loosely based on my husband, right? Because his family escaped as well. So when his father was approached by the Communist Party and said, become a communist, or take a gun, run into the hills, and you know, join the war, they left, but they left in a different way. Many Afghan refugees, like Sherbat Gula, remember the girl with the green eyes, they literally climbed the mountains into Iran, into Pakistan. Um, but my husband's father, um, he had a lot of connections at the university, so what he did is he said, I want to go on Hajj. I don't know, you know, the Muslim students in here know what a Hajj is. Hajj is when you go on pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. So he said, I'm going on Hajj. And he bribed the communists, got their papers, got on a plane and left for Saudi Arabia. But once they got to Saudi Arabia, they had to give up their passport. So they were a family without a country. So then, you know, at that point, they were helped by a Saudi sheikh who found out my, my father-in-law was um, a professor uh, of agriculture. And he said to him, they lived in the city of Jeddah, he said, make my city green and, and you can live here. But he was given the recommendation by another um, a waiter at a restaurant who was Pakistani. He said, don't stay here. You will make money, but you will not have a country you should go somewhere where you will be part of that country. So that's why my father-in-law decided to come back to the US. So, um, sorry, I went on a tangent. So you asked me, so it's very loosely based on Farid's story, my husband, but you know, they didn't lose the youngest son, or yeah, Farid has a younger brother, so they didn't lose him. So that part is the fiction part, that part is the novel part, yes. Go ahead. So have you been similar to your father-in-law? In many ways, yes, because you know, this happens when you're a refugee and you're an immigrant. So my father-in-law was a professor, and he didn't get a job right away at teaching as a professor. You know, their family struggled. He washed dishes. He, you know, did a lot of things to support his family the way Fadi does. So, you know, Fadi's father is driving a taxi um, to support his family. But there's, it's all honorable work, and this is what you do to support your family and, and to, to make a new life. Why? Part of it is children's literature, you know, this is a, a whole, there aren't a lot of stories about diverse characters. So out of 100 books, maybe 10 are published about African Americans, Latinos, uh, gay lesbians, disabled children. So there is a need. And America is becoming more and more diverse. So the goal is, for maybe an Afghan child to pick up the book and see themselves in shooting Kabul, but also the book is read in a place like Iowa, where there are very few minorities, and for maybe an African American or white child to read about a character they would never meet in person, but they would know about their story and have sympathy with them. So the concept is called windows and mirrors. You want stories that are a mirror to a child who sees themselves, and windows for a child who is from a different background or culture to, to see, look into the window and see their life. So there is a need for stories. From, that's why I urge you to write stories 
about your experience. Um, you know, um, the book I'm writing about Syria. There are very few, you know, um, Arab characters in books. So, you know, there's always a need. Okay. Can you repeat the question, please? Why, why do you choose to write about Maria? Why do I choose to write about her? About because sadly, children are the biggest victims of war, right? And what happens is grown-ups go to war, you know, uh, you know, it's because of economics and power and aggression, but the kids suffer the most. And I wanted kids to know how fortunate they are to have what they have. And for me, Mariam represented kind of, you know, the worst of war because so many kids are injured and die. If, I mean, if you've seen the news, what is going on in Syria and Aleppo, the little boy who had the, you know, whose house was in the explosion. So for me, it's a way to create awareness about these type of issues. Oh, the, the most important thing, see, my books tend to, you know, talk about real life and the real world. So for me, the research is very important and I do a lot of research. So uh, it, part of it is to get all of that right. Um, you know, when did the war happen? You know, when, when in, in politics was this person elected? So, excuse me, in the background, especially the book I'm writing on Syria, I need to know all the groups that are fighting against each other, you know, in Syria, it's so sad. What is was a beautiful country. Um, you know, in Aleppo is one of the oldest city that has been. People have lived there for five thousand years. So, in now in four years, the city is demolished. So it's knowing. You know, when this group came. Um, you know, who was fighting with each other? The poor people. What were they experiencing? So it's. So I've been talking to journalists, I've been talking to Syrians, so it's, that's the most challenging part is getting, getting it right. finish it. Let's be honest. You're very happy it's done. Yeah. And then what happens is it goes away. You give it to your publishing company, to your editor, and you don't think about it because you're working on the next book. So it's very satisfying. Uh, we joke. We writers, we joke with each other. We say that writing is a disease. It's a mental disease because characters talk to, to us in our head. And it's something that we just feel we have to do. So it's very satisfying. It's, the whole writing process is very satisfying, but very difficult as well, um, because different writers have different strengths and weaknesses. Supposedly, I'm very good at plotting. I'm good at putting down the story. Character development, that means you know, making your character realistic, I'm terrible at. So my editor tells me, great story. What is your character feeling? What are they thinking? So it's, you have to really balance these things. But overall, it's wonderful. The most the, the, the best thing about it is getting emails from the kids. So I had kids from West Virginia, you know, three schools read the book. These are children who'd never met a minority besides, you know, a few African Americans and Latinos in their community, but they could really connect with Fadi's story because his story is like anybody else's story. It's about a boy trying to get through school, having family economic problems in his house, financial, um, you know, so what is more satis most satisfactory, satisfying to me is showing the humanity, uh, you know, that, you know, everybody is more similar than they are different. Zafuna, the mom? 
Wow, that's a tough one. She was one of my hardest characters because usually the mother is the one that, who is always there, right? And um, so for, for a mother to be so mentally disturbed by losing her daughter, that was very difficult to write. But unfortunately, you know, so many mothers are going through that around the world, you know, of losing their kids, of facing, you know, leaving their countries and their wars. Um, so she's kind of a reflection of so many women around the world who are going through a similar thing. Yeah. Yes. My name is it's, it's very hard for a family to abandon a child. Uh, what is the, the reason? What is the reason for in the novel uh, Marian was abandoned? Uh, and uh, why the family uh, don't cancel this trip? Yes, and, and what? Yeah. There are, uh, are there some contradictions in the Muslim beliefs? Oh, well, great question. Um, the book talks a lot about Afghan culture. So, you know, and, and there's something called the code, the Pashtun code that the Pashtun people have. And a lot of people have said, you know, maybe the family shouldn't have left. Why did they go? Um, that's a challenge a writer has. Because if they didn't go, I didn't have a book. <laughs> right? So part of it is it's a great question, but life has choices. So in the real world, people have choices. In the books, characters have choices. So for me, I had to have them do that. But no, it has nothing to do with Islamic, you know, of course, it's, it's you know, Muslim countries, sadly, families are separating. People are having to make hard choices. If you're seeing these poor families from Syria on the boats in the Mediterranean, um, you know, families are being torn apart. Unfortunately, it's just, you know, part of the situation, yeah. Because life is hard. I want you guys to learn. I mean, I say this to the kids too. And that's why reading is so important. Remember, I was an accounting major, but I was a reader. My vocabulary is good because I read hard kid books as a kid. I was actually reading some books my mother shouldn't have let me read, right, when I was a kid. But what happens is when you read, you may not understand your, the word, but it sticks in the back of your head. And, you know, easy is never good. <laughs> Difficult is better. Okay, you pick, Jessica. <laughs> who, who? Okay, sure, please. Okay. So, first of all, I really like your how you write the book about the senior person and the idea of resisting and Islam. That is really the impact of my, I would say, like the point of the world. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you think of Sharbat Gula, she was a child who, who was lost, you know? Um, and also, you know, in all wars, um, you know, there was a story about, um, you know, Rwanda and also the Congo, where so many kids had to flee by themselves because their village was attacked and these children would be groups of children and they would have to try to get to a refugee camp. So uh, it's, it's, it's a story, unfortunately, that is going on every day. Yeah. Oh, thank you. One more. Yes. In this novel, oh boy, who's my favorite character? I like Habib. You know, Habib is one of my favorite characters, the dad. Why? Because he handles such a difficult situation with so much grace, right? Um, you know, he has a wife who's having a mental breakdown. He has a daughter who got left behind. 
he's adjusting, you know, he was a big professor, he drives a taxi, so, and how he handles things, you know, it's very, very admirable, I think. Okay, one more. So characters, I'm very bad at developing characters. So that's something I have to really work. I can, I love, you know, writing how Fadi got into the taxi and how they left, I'm very, you know, I enjoy writing action, but when you have to sit down and think, how is he feeling? You know, how's Habib feeling? I have a hard time with that. So that is something that I, I usually write the book and then I go back and I um, expand or really think about the characters and how they're feeling and what they're saying and how they're acting. So that's my challenge. Oh, yes. What am I doing? Yes. <coughs> you said something? Uh, my students wanted to know from my class uh, what family honor means. Oh, family honor. Absolutely. So I was mentioned this a little bit that, you know, um, Afghanistan is made up of different, um, um, different ethnic groups. So the Pashtuns or the Pakhtuns, who Fadi is, is part of his family, are about, you know, um, oh, I'll have to ask for you. I mean, they're close to 40%. And the Taliban came from that community. But there are also Hazaras. And Hazaras also, they um, are very, they look like, um, have Asian features because they say they come from Genghis Khan group and they're, they're Tajik, so it's a huge mixture of people who live there. But the Pashtuns um, have lived in Afghanistan before Islam, um, you know, before Buddhism, before anything. So they have a very old um, code that they follow. So people ask, remember when, when Osama bin Laden was in Afghanistan, how come these Afghans just don't give him to us? It has to do with the code called Melmastia, which means if you are my guest, even if you are my enemy, if you're eating my food at my table, I will not give you. Even if you are my enemy, if you are in my home and eating my food, I must protect you. So they have a lot of codes. So they have, also remember, these are people who live in the mountains. And so your word is, has to be very strong. So Louise, if I say, Louis, I'm, you know, Louise, I'm gonna sell you my cow. And you're like, yes, it is word. These are the people, there's no contract, there's no writing. I say, Louise, come next Wednesday, take my cow. And if I don't give you my cow, my word is gone. You have no honor. So it's, it's a very, and it's, it's, it's a concept in many cultures. And you know, Latino culture, you know? You know, your honor is very strong, you know? And so it's a concept that is in, in many cultures. <laughs> Guilty? <laughs> oh, that's a good the Barbie, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody get a pass Guilt in the family, yeah. Yes. See this this is what we do as writers. We want to make things hard for our character. It would be so boring if Fadi found her on the internet. There's no book. So as a writer, your goal is to make it challenging, to use hard words, you know so that you know, you're reading the story and are interested. Well, partly the, word, the, the book has a lot of um, Afghan words, right? So you have to look in the back. That's somebody nobody knows. Even I have to look it up in the back, right? Um, but coming back to you know, language, um, it, is a, it is a harder children's book because it uses a lot of words that I think you know, just, just make you think harder um, and also synonyms, right? If you don't understand the word, go look it up and you know, you'll find other words around it and then all of a sudden you know five words. Right, so yeah. Yes? Oh, his pictures? Yeah, How I got so that idea? This chapter I'm reading. Oh, okay. Picture. So Steve McCurry, remember I showed you Steve? Yes, yes. He is famous for portraits. You guys should go on the internet, look up Steve. He has beautiful pictures. And for him, the face tells such a story. So why did people fall in love with Sharbat Gula? 
it was the kind of the fear and, 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 and the story she could tell with her face. So it's just the, I mean, I don't want to give anything away. So, you know, in photography, you do action, you do portrait. So a lot of it was along the lines of, you know, what Steve's philosophy is on photography. Of bullies? Yeah. My main thing is nobody wakes up and decides to start a war or just wakes up and decides to be a bully. There are things that happen in your life that make your life difficult and you decide to take your anger out on other people. So it's about choices. So uh, I don't know if you guys remember Mr. Singh who was beaten up. Now Mr. Singh was a Sikh. People thought Right? Yeah, People yeah. thought. But they are uh, behind a problem of the uh, of the racism, racism of the uh, Yes. They are a behind very, very yeah. that's, there's a problem behind in everything. That's the problem. People forget the original problem. And they keep creating more and more problem because they forget that original problem. In every country, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Luis, do you want my cow? <laughs> <laughs> you wrote a book um, uh, in, 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 in schools, so, or you wrote uh, in, schools, in, in some kind of group, so for example, uh, in France, or... Um, who's reading it? Yeah. Well, so my books tend to be in libraries and schools. So that's a nice thing. So actually the books are read a lot in schools and also, uh, it, it also they're, they're used in libraries a lot. So uh, I mean that's the goal, to get, get the right book into the hand of the right person that can, you know, windows and mirrors. Either it's, it's a book that they can feel connection to or a book that they can look at and learn about the world. So does that answer your question? Okay. okay. There's so many, oh, so a book after Shooting Kabul? So Saving Kabul Corner is kind of the companion to Shooting Kabul. So Fadi's in there and Mariam's in there. It's a different story, but some of the characters do come, come into it. Mm -hmm.